Who would have thought math could be so controversial or delicious? If this pizza is the totality of Canada's pension plan assets and Alberta comes along and says, we want out, we're taking what's ours and leaving, the amount of pizza that would be left for the whole rest of Canada would be about this much. And I say about because it's actually a little less. The Alberta government would take about half the pizza and a little bit of that slice, about 53% of the CPP's assets. And I can tell you right now, they're not 53% of the population. So how did they arrive at this number? And in the second half of this explainer, does that number make sense? We've got a formula for how uh, we would be able to do the transfer of assets. So this is just a very factual report. Before I explain how they plucked 53% or $334 billion seemingly out of thin air, let me address one very simple point. That yes, they are allowed to pack up their bags and take what's theirs in order to start their own fund. So basically the CPP Act was formed in 1965 and it articulated that the provinces when they came together to form the CPP, they did have the options to leave it. That is Bonnie Jean McDonald, by the way. She's an actuary who has spent her entire career studying aging, finances, and pensions. And she will be back. So yeah, this is all laid out in the Canada Pension Plan Act, which, yes, I have spent hours of my life staring at so that I can take you exactly to the spot that matters, Section 113, which details exactly how a province determines what's theirs when leaving the CPP to start their own pension fund, which, by the way, has never been done before. Quebec has its own pension plan, yes, but that's because it never joined the CPP in the first place. The idea of Alberta leaving? Totally uncharted territory. So, Alberta commissioned a company called LifeWorks to chart those waters, first of all, by reading the CPP Act. And their interpretation, Yes, Alberta gets money, and oh boy, does it ever get a lot of money. 334 billion of a pot that's around 530 billion today. So here's how that works according to this interpretation of the federal legislation. So here's the pot of gold totaling about 530 billion with a B dollars. To figure out what Alberta is entitled to, it's allowed to calculate two things. First of all, all of the money that Albertans have ever contributed to the pot. So whenever you get your paycheck, there are deductions, right? Last year, if you were employed, you paid a percentage of your pensionable earnings into the CPP and your employer matched that. So if you take the sum total of what, let me use red here, if you take the sum total of what all Albertans have chipped in, working Albertans, since 1966, when we all basically started contributing, that's a big chunk of money, about $163 billion, over about half a century, and they want it back. But what's more, for 50 plus years, that money wasn't just sitting between some couch cushions, right? That money was making money, being invested. And so, according to the LifeWorks study, Albertans should get those profits back too. All of those years of compound interest on $163 billion, Alberta is owed all of that. Now, of course, Albertans were also paid out benefits, right? Over these years. So they would have been drawing from the CPP actual pension dollars that would have to go back into the pot, deducted from what they paid in. But at the end of the day, this is how you arrive at Alberta's supposed take-home share of $334 billion. All of the money that they put in, plus all of the money that that money made being invested, less whatever they've pulled out in benefits. So the way that CPP Act interprets it, the, the asset transfer is that they basically take uh, the contributions that people have made, they add on the investment return, and then they also take off any money that's con out. So 
That all sounds pretty logical, right? Alberta gets out what it put in, and because Albertans on average earn more, they have a pretty young population, lots of contributing workers, not as many collecting seniors, it makes sense that they get a larger share. Or does it? So the LifeWorks just didn't have the data to basically do this calculation uh, thoroughly. So there are a couple of red flags that tell actuaries like Bonnie Jean that something is off here. Because consider this, if both Alberta and Ontario, let's say, left the pension plan and took what's owed to them using this methodology, there would literally be nothing left in the CPP. Both Alberta and Ontario are net contributors. So them taking their share leaves the rest of the country with zero dollars, which doesn't seem right. And apparently, if you do the math for every province pulling out of the CPP and taking what's rightfully theirs, you end up needing something like 900% of what's actually in the fund today. So let's find the disconnect, starting with the idea that Alberta is entitled to all the money its money made. Some of the money was actually not even invested. It was some of that money actually went to pay pensions in other provinces. So the problem with just assuming that everything Albertans have ever contributed has just been earning investment returns for the last 50 plus years is that it's just not true. Because sometimes money goes into the fund and then immediately comes right back out to pay someone's pension, earning zero return. Someone in Alberta may put in a dollar and if you said, okay, that dollar got investment returns over 50 years, but when in fact, that dollar, half of it was used to pay for a pension over in Nova Scotia, that's why the investment return formula doesn't really work here. The LifeWorks study actually has this chart showing the nominal rates of return on all of Alberta's share of contributions over the years. So of course, if you add that up, you end up with a huge number. When, according to experts in the field, the actual calculation that you need to do is so much more nuanced than that. You have to track where dollars are actually going, what's being invested, what's being paid out, as opposed to just making these huge sweeping assumptions that every dollar in somehow earns compound interest for 50 years. Just the formula itself doesn't make, it's not the way pension actuaries usually treat this topic. So that's the first problem. Problem number two isn't about bad math, it's about bad data. The second problem stems from an admission LifeWorks actually includes in its own study. They say the benefits being drawn out of the CPP to pay Albertans, that probably only counts people who actually retire in Alberta, which means it's not counting all of those people who move to Alberta for work and become pensioners elsewhere. If I was coming from Halifax and working in Fort Murray, it would look like in the data that they had that I was contributing in Alberta when in fact I'm really a Nova Scotia resident. And this happens a lot as evidenced by Alberta's demographics. Lots of people come to the province to work, you know, think of every boom bust cycle the province has ever lived through, but then they retire next door in BC or they go back home out east. All of those out of province pensioners spent their most productive years contributing to the CPP under Team Alberta. So, of course, Alberta's numbers look good. Then, when it comes time to pull that money back out as a pension, LifeWorks says it just doesn't know how much of that to trace back to Alberta being a drain on the CPP. LifeWorks notes, additional refinements may be needed for an actual final calculation to reflect the payments to individuals who migrated to or from Alberta following a retirement or who had a period of employment in Alberta. So that's the kind of data that they wouldn't be able to capture. And because there were so many migrant workers, that could make a really huge difference to calculating this. So by tallying Alberta's contributions, but grossly understating its liabilities, critics wonder, how can any of this be fair? Which brings us to the third and final problem. Now, this final point, I think, is so important, I don't want to muck it up. I just kind of want to let Bonnie Jean explain the whole thing, because she does it better than I could. So the third issue is really around, like, the fairness of this. So, again, when you go and buy car insurance, 
You don't know if you're going to be a winner or a loser because you don't know if you're actually going to get into a car accident. So the same thing happens with pension plans. When the provinces went into the pension plan, it was hard to really know who's going to get the most out of this plan and who's going to get the least. So kind of at this point in time and saying, oh, I wish I didn't buy that lottery ticket because I didn't win. It's a little bit late in the game to go back and try to get your, your, you know, the money you paid for the ticket back. I hope you caught all that because it's an argument that sets all the numbers aside and focuses instead on the spirit within which all of the provinces, except Quebec, agreed to be part of the CPP to begin with. This idea that entering this arrangement was a way for every province to pool resources and hedge their bets. So sure, some provinces will contribute more and some less, but individually, every Canadian contributes the same percentage of their pensionable earnings. So to retroactively lump all the net contributors together and say, aha, the rest of you owe us, that can feel to some, well, unfair. So again, to, to then, to, to, to go into a, con a social contract and then later to say, oh no, I was a, I didn't get as much as you did, retroactively let's change things. That's the part that kind of, um, I think, bothers uh, the experts. So that's where we stand. We have, on the one hand, one study suggesting a formula for which the Alberta government can and should extract more than half of the country's pension plan assets. And on the other hand, we have basically the rest of the country saying, hold on, that's not all yours. But I should add, this is far from a done deal. Even Alberta's government says it's only exploring the idea and would put it to a referendum before doing anything else. And Albertans themselves are very divided on whether pulling out of the CPP is a good idea because going in alone when times are good doesn't seem that risky. But when things go sour, risk that doesn't spread evenly can be very painful.